anything that has great power has great sound. How does that diesel 18-wheeler pull that 40,000-pound load? Because when you run by hot ride beside it, you can't hear yourself talk. It doesn't say that God lives in our gathering. It doesn't even say that God lives in my preaching. But it said God lives in praise. And so that's when you get out here and you just start getting a little crazy a little bit. And you quit worrying about what people think and, and you just get your hands in the air and you start singing. And you start shouting, you start spinning and hopping like everybody on the stage. And this is some of the next level stuff I'm talking about. God wants to come in a greater dimension than he ever has before. But we're going to have to praise him with a liberty and with a fervency like we've never praised him before. behind what we do. When I ask you, lift all over your hands, lift, lift, all over the room, just lift your hands now. When I do that, why? Because it's the universal sign of surrender and victory. Raising your hands has dual meaning. Universally, all over the world, it's the sign of victory. Universally, all over the world, it's the sign of surrender. Surrender to God and God brings the victory. When we lift our hands, there's something wonderful that happens. Uh, the Bible says that Michael looked on her husband, David. Guys, when I tell you a next level foolishness, this ain't my message yet. I'm just building up to it. When I'm telling you a next level foolishness, David was a king. Okay? He disrobed himself down to his underwear when they were bringing the presence of God back into Jerusalem because the Ark of the Covenant was stolen under Saul and Saul didn't care enough about it to go back and get it. And there's another message. All the priests kept going through all of their functions although the Ark wasn't even behind the curtain. Everybody just kept going through the motions not even knowing God wasn't even there. I don't want to be that church. But David cared about God's presence, so he went and retrieved the Ark of the Covenant. And when they were bringing it back through the streets of Jerusalem, the capital, the Bible says he disrobed and danced before the Lord with all his might. No pageantry, no pomp, no red carpet, okay? The trumpets were not blowing in the air. There was no military salute. This guy said, no dignity today in front of the presence of God. I'm going all out. And I'm going to tell you something. I believe that was an ugly dance. Uh, all, uh, with all your might dance, I bet there was arms and legs just going everywhere. That couldn't have been pretty. And his wife, the Bible says his wife saw him from the balcony and hated him. And talked about how undignified he was acting as a king. And the Bible says from that point forward, she was struck barren. So I tell people, when your life is barren, what do you need to do? Dance. Everything has a reason for it. Whatever we ask you to do, there's purpose behind it, okay? When I'm talking about next level in our praise, praise is God's mechanism for, I believe, breaking pride because you can't do it the way God said do it and be full of pride. It's impossible. I think that's why now all of our songs that are written are worship. We try to bypass praise because praise is foolish. In Acts chapter 2, when all of them were praising and speaking in the Holy Ghost, the onlookers looked in and said, these guys are drunk. I wonder how many churches you could look into today and everybody say, them guys are drunk. Not many. Because nobody gets that foolish. We're too polished. Got too much status. We've had too many successes. We got too much education. There's a next level atmosphere waiting on us. But it's going to take a push in this area. There's a great warfare that goes on in your praise. In the natural, remember the Old Testament, everything is outer 
physical, natural. New Testament, it's all inner, invisible, and spiritual. Same stuff. One you can see, the new covenant you can't see it. In the old covenant, praise threw enemy into confusion. So in other words, we know that Satan's kingdom is highly organized and is highly strategic and they do not fight against each other and he is not divided. You have to go to church to find that. Satan does not, is not divided against himself. Okay? And over and over again in the Old Testament, they were getting ready to go in with their swords and shields and God said, throw them down and praise. And when they praised, the enemy turned on each other because it thrown through them into confusion. Okay? What you don't understand is everything that has been assigned a street strategically against you, when you open your mouth to foolishly and unashamedly praise God, you are rearranging things in the unseen realm. And you are, t the enemy that is organized against you, you are disorganizing his strategy. Come on, somebody. In other words, what you look, it looks like he's carrying out everything he purposed to carry out. But when you let out a praise out of your mouth and just won't worry about what people think and people's opinion, then all of a sudden you start throwing the enemy into confusion and they begin to turn on each other and let all the people say amen. <laughs> I need to tell your neighbor something else. Say, we're about to have some fun. It's Genesis chapter 1. Okay? Then God said, let there be light and there was light. Okay? And God saw that it was good. Verse 10, and God called the dry land the earth and the gathering together the waters he called seas. And God said, it is good. And the earth that brings forth grass and seed that yields fruit according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. God made two great lights, verse 16, the greater to rule by the day, the lesser to rule by the night. And when God saw the light that divided the darkness from the light, he said, it was good. Verse 21, God created sea creatures. And after he'd finished, the Bible says, God saw it and said, it is good. Verse 25, and God made every beast of the earth. And at the end, God saw it and said, it is good. Lord, bless the reading of your word and help me to communicate in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen. Give me a few minutes to work this thing. It's one of the power, most powerful revelations God's ever given me. There's four things I want to tell you about sound. The first thing that God created was not light. The first thing God created was sound. And God said, let there be light. If he had not have said it, there would have been no light. Some of you, it is not happening because you have not yet made a sound. God rides on sound. Faith can't even be seen. Faith comes by hearing, by sound being made, and hearing by the Word of God. <laughs> Everything. Number one, whenever God wants something, stay with me, this is so powerful. Some of you deep thinkers, you're going to like this. It's deep. Whenever God wants something, he doesn't call out what he wants. He speaks to what holds it and tells what is holding it to turn it loose. Okay? God never said, let there be corn, potatoes, tomatoes, and green beans and squash and zucchini. God said, let the earth bring forth. In other words, I've already put everything in the earth for food. Now, earth, turn your potential loose. Because everything is already in you, now let it go. God never said, let there be Jupiter, Uranus, Mars, Saturn. God never said that. He said, let the heavens bring forth. 
because everything was in the heavens that was needed to sustain every star, every planet, every Milky Way, every galaxy. God already put it there. So in other words, he told the heavens, turn loose of what I've already put in you. He didn't call what he wanted. He told what held it to let it go. God didn't say, let there be sea bass and let there be halibut and let there be, he didn't let there be flounder. He didn't say that. He said, let the waters bring forth because the waters already had potential for fish. The water already held potential for life. So he commanded the water to turn loose what was already on the inside of it. Okay? Now, woo. So now when God speaks to us, let me back up. I got another one. Just thought of it. I ain't got any notes much on this, folks. When God wanted people, he spoke to himself. We were God's potential. God turned around, looked in the mirror and said, let us make man in our image and in our likeness. And when he spoke to himself, I popped out and you popped out. Come on, somebody. Because <laughs> life begins in heaven. Hallelujah. <laughs> so <laughs> now God speaks to your spirit. And when he speaks to your spirit, when God speaks to you, God's not doing things around you to make your life happen because your future is already in you. And so when God speaks to you, then your spirit has to let go of what God has already put in it. you. He wants your economy. He wants your children. He wants your legacy because what he has is progressive and you've got to understand that unless you become the one that stands between two generations and breaks it, that it's just going to continue to increase because what you do not confront grows. There are two kingdoms that are in constant conflict around you daily. In this series, Hidden in Plain Sight, Pastor Ron discusses these battles and also gives you the keys to overcome generational curses. I'm telling you, if you release the blessing of God in your life, you're going to see things that used to could get you, they can't get you anymore. Things that used to paralyze you can't paralyze you anymore. Ah, things that used to make you fearful and afraid, they can't make you afraid anymore. This series is available for your gift of $40 or more. Call now and we will include free shipping and an MP3 download card. Call 1-888-259-8200. Call now or visit roncarpenter.com or write to the address on your screen. Don't go anywhere. We're going to get back to that word in just a moment. But I want to just break right here for just a second and I want to ask you, uh, would you consider something? I am always so grateful to all of our wonderful covenant partners and maybe people who aren't covenant partners, but you give occasionally, some of you frequently, some of you uh, whenever there's that ability. But I want you to notice we didn't sell any ads and we didn't have any sponsors and we didn't have any commercials because we believe the gospel of Jesus, that the people of God are so passionate about his message going forth, the message of salvation and the message of his kingdom, the way we can live an abundant life is the most important thing in the earth. And we believe that with such a deep passion that we give and we give sacrificially. Would you consider, those of you who have been given your continued faithful giving, those of you who maybe occasionally, would you become a consistent giver? Maybe those of you who've been blessed but never given before, maybe for the first time, becoming a monthly covenant partner or just a one-time gift. But we want to do everything we can to stay on the air and represent Jesus Christ in a very powerful and a very excellent way. We have a great team of people right here who are just as passionate about it as I am. And with you, the viewers, helping us do what we do, there's no end to how many people we can reach. We're in the greatest days ever of seeing more people saved than we ever have before. Would you help me go further? 
give now. The greatest thing you can do is hear the voice of God. Because every time God speaks, that means there's something in your spirit that your spirit has to let go of. And that begins to create the next step that you walk into, and the next door that you will walk through, who am I preaching to, and the next season that you walk out in your life. So whenever God wants something, remember this, he doesn't talk to what he wants. He talks to what holds it and says, let it go. I want somebody to say that with me. Say, let it go. Come on, say it three times. Say, let it go. Come on, third time. Say, let it go. Ah, give God a praise in this place. I'm going somewhere. I'm going somewhere with this. Ah. Now, everything in life follows the sound it makes. For those of you here in 2015, if I don't preach this as good, it's because I didn't have no time to prepare. Everything in life follows the sound it makes. Okay? The jet doesn't go left and the sound go right. The jet follows the sound it makes. The train is not heading west and you only hear it north. It follows the sound that it makes. If I want to find something, I follow where's the sound coming from. If I want to follow the siren, I follow the sound. Even when I can't see the light, I follow the sound. I follow the sound. Okay? So your life follows the sound you make. Here's where church people mess up so bad. We wait till something happens and then we make a sound. Instead of making a sound to make something happen. So something bad happens and we make a depressing sound. And because we keep making a depressing sound, something that was only meant to last a couple of days now has lasted six months. Because the sound is keeping it alive. <laughs> but instead, we should be speaking to make something happen. The Bible said, let the weak say I am strong. When? While you're still weak. So that makes you look like an idiot. When you sit there and you don't have two quarters rubbed together to buy a Coke at a Coke machine, and you're telling people how blessed you are, that makes you look ridiculous to people. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. Come on, somebody. So in other words, it looks like foolishness to them, but in heaven it is God's wisdom. So when you are down to your last nickel, that's when you begin to say, I am the blessed of the Lord. I'm the seed of Abraham, and his blessing falls on me. And the blessing of the Lord maketh one rich, and he has no sorrow to it. Come on. And God, come on. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, and he's given his people to eat of the fat of the land. That's what we got to do. And you don't do that once you've been blessed. You do it when you're on the bottom of life looking up and then that sound will reach down and pick you up and carry you where you want to go shout hallelujah <laughs> let the poor say I am rich and what the world don't understand is all you're doing is you're putting a sound in the direction you want your life to go you don't like the direction your life is headed, change the sound. Uh, so it can't be that simple. Oh, it's that simple. You don't like the way your marriage is, go into your house and change the sound. I can change your sound and change your husband's sound, and I can change your marriage by changing the sound. <clears throat> don't like where your career's headed, walk into the office building and change the sound. you depressed, don't turn on the blues and pull down the shade. <laughs> what are you doing? You're locking yourself in an emotion that was meant to be temporary. But you're having a sound now that is causing it to remain long after its season is over. Okay? Every significant power, number three in the earth, is accompanied by a significant sound. 
in most cases, maybe not exhaustively, but 99% of the time, anything that has great power has great sound. I've lived through one tornado coming down the interstate following my car. I was coming out of Atlanta, and I headed off on a, the ramp and ran inside, just left my car door open, ran inside this gas station, and everybody there huddled inside of the, the beer freezer because that thing weighed a million pounds and it was bolted to the concrete. And I'm like, everything else is gonna go, but they're gonna protect their beer. I'm telling you that. <laughs> Kill the people, but don't let nothing happen to the beer. <laughs> and I remember the sound when that thing came over that building and the earth shaking as that tornado crossed over that bed. Why? <laughs> because anything that can yank a house off its foundation has a great sound. The force of hurricane winds, the sound they make when they whirl through the streets and whirl around the house because anything with great power is accompanied by great sound. How does that diesel 18-wheeler pull that 40,000-pound load? Because when you run behind, ride beside it, you can't hear yourself talk. Everybody that works at the airport, how do they make 200,000 tons fly 500 miles an hour? Because everybody at the airport is wearing earmuffs because of the sound of those engines. Anything that has great power is accompanied by great sound. Why has the devil spent so much time making churches quiet? You want to go to some of the most boring places on the face of the planet? What are powerful, what are powerful football games? The stadiums where the fans are rowdy. Because when you make a sound, what happens? It lifts everything in the building up. See, they don't even know about spiritual dynamics. But there's something happening when 70,000 people get up and your team is against the wall and they're about to score, but all of a sudden the crowd gets into the game and the team finds something that they didn't have before the tank team starts screaming. Why? Because power comes on the back of that sound. Who am I talking to in this place? Are you understanding what I'm saying today? Shout amen if you are. Ah, I'm going to keep going. Now, the Bible says God inhabits praise. <clears throat> Pardon me. The word inhabits means makes a dwelling place. <clears throat> so it doesn't say God lives in our church service. Because I've been in a lot of church services. God wasn't anywhere. <clears throat> I mean, God was down the road at Chick-fil-A. He was nowhere near that building. <laughs> and just because we got up, cleaned up, and drove over here does not mean God is obligated to come in our midst. It doesn't say that God lives in our gathering. Okay? It doesn't even say that God lives in my preaching. But it said God lives in praise. You want to assure yourself that there's never a dead service? Then build God a house. How do you build God a house? You build God a house with your praise. Your praise has to do with make, get, sing unto the Lord a new song and give him a great big sound, the sound of string instruments. <coughs> give him the sound of the cymbals. Give him the clanging of the cymbals. All these things are what God wants. If you ever look at God's people praising, it was not pretty it was loud and it was chaotic but God always inhabited it <laughs> so if I want to experience a small God then build him a small house just golf golf course praising <laughs> open your mouth and shout him amen Okay, you've built God a small house today, you will experience a small God because you've made no room for him. But then you got those people that as soon as the first notes hit, they get out now <laughs> because they need God in a big way. And you may need a small God to get you out of their problems, but they need a great. Yeah. 
they need a big God for what they're dealing with. And so that's when you get out here and you just start getting a little crazy a little bit and you quit worrying about what people think and, and you just get your hands in the air and you start singing, you start shouting, you start spinning and hopping like everybody on the stage. And this is some of the next level stuff I'm talking about. God wants to come in a greater dimension than he ever has before. But we're going to have to praise him with a liberty and with a fervency like we've never praised him before. And that means we're going to have to come and be participants, not spectators, and open up our mouth and lift our hands and clap our hands and dance around and turn and sing and let the stringed instruments play, let the band play, let all the people of God dance. This is a next level move that I'm hearing God say, if you'll praise me like I say, praise me, I'll move like you've never seen me move. Give God 10 seconds of praise in this place. Tell your neighbor, say, this is getting good. This is getting good. I want to take a moment before you get off the air because I think it would be tragic uh, for you to have stayed with me these last few minutes and given me uh, this much of your time and me not have a chance to lead you to Jesus. Whether you're deficient, whether you're depleted, whether life is pretty good or whether life is tragic, everybody needs a Savior. Everybody has that void deep down on the inside that success, significance, money, nothing else will satisfy. Only Jesus can satisfy the longings of the heart. And I want to offer you Jesus today. It's this simple. Would you pray with me? It goes like this. Jesus, come into my heart. Be my Lord and Savior. I believe you are the Son of God. I believe you died and rose on the third day so I could be saved. I ask you to forgive me of my sins. Make my heart your home. I receive your gift of salvation in Jesus' name. Amen. And just like that, you've been saved. You've been born again. Now you got to let us know. So write in, call, do whatever you have to. We want to know what God has done in your life. You know the enemy doesn't just want you. He wants your economy. He wants your children. He wants your legacy. Because what he has is progressive. And you've got to understand that unless you become the one that stands between two generations and breaks it, that it's just going to continue to increase. Because what you do not confront grows. There are two kingdoms that are in constant conflict around you daily. In this series, Hidden in Plain Sight, Pastor Ron discusses these battles and also gives you the keys to overcome generational curses. I'm telling you, if you release the blessing of God in your life, you're going to see things that used to could get you, they can't get you anymore. Things that used to paralyze you can't paralyze you anymore. Ah, things that used to make you fearful and afraid, they can't make you afraid anymore. This series is available for your gift of $40 or more. Call now and we will include free shipping and an MP3 download card. Call 1-888-259-8200. Call now or visit roncarpenter.com or write to the address on your screen.